So uh, welcome to the Vectors Independent Study uh, as part of the Calculus and Vectors course. Uh, so the first section we have to cover is, um, well, what is a vector in the first place? And uh, what are the basic operations that you can do on them? So uh, we're going to start with uh, just two words that I'm going to toss up here for you. The first one is scalar, and the second one is vector. So these are the two types of values that you're going to come across in either physics or calculus or math in general. Uh, so a scalar is a uh, type of number that has a size or a magnitude, so it has magnitude, and has a unit. So something like uh, your weight is something like that, right? You can have a mass of, let's say, 84 kilograms. So you can see the two pieces of this number there. You have a ma of the magnitude there. That's how, how big it is. And then you have the unit, which is telling you what, um, what chunks you're counting. So things like... Uh, the time it takes you to get to uh, work every day, or the amount of money in your bank account, uh, or, um, well, like again, weights, those things are scalar values. The vector is a little bit different. Um, it has a magnitude, just like scalars. It has magnitude. Uh, it has a unit as well. But the thing that makes a, a vector different from a scalar is that a vector has direction. So a number that would be an example of a vector was if you drove 15 kilometers west. So you can see there the three pieces. I have the size of this number, right, it's 15. 15 what? Well, 15 kilometers, that's the unit we're in. And then you've got this thing here, the direction you're headed. So something like, uh, for well, for a scalar, a good test to see if a number is a scalar is to add this word, west, uh, to the back of it and see if it makes any sense. So. For example, 84 kilograms west. Well, that, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, right? The direction your weight is going, um, that's not a thing. But if you were to start at your house and travel 15 kilometers west, you would be in a different place than if you went 15 kilometers south, right? The direction that you head matters. So, Things like this with directions on them. That's what a vector is. It's not just how far you go It's not just what unit you're using to measure your travel It's in in which direction did you head because going this way and going that way lead to two very different locations All right So we can uh, just sort of draw an example here for you There you go. I have a vector I've drawn on the board for you. It starts here and it ends there. So start, stop, and I'm going to give it a name. Uh, let's go with P. This is vector P. Now to show you that it's a vector and not just a scalar, I'm going to put a little arrow on top of it. So anytime you see a letter with a, this arrow on top, it's telling you that you're dealing with this type of number, that there must be some direction attached to that thing. So I'm going to take vector p and I'm going to think about what it's doing and it looks to me like it goes this way five units and it goes this way six units. 
I just made that up. But if that were the case, this particular vector is heading five units that way and six units that way. So I need to find a way to write that other than drawing this triangle every time because that would be very cumbersome. So the way I'm going to accomplish that is I'm going to write vector p is equal to, uh, well, 5 horizontally and 6 vertically. I need a way to separate these two numbers so that I know not to add them or multiply them or to read that as 56. So I'm just going to toss a, a comma in there. And to show you that I'm, that I'm done, that I have all the information, I'm just going to package that in a bracket like that. So vector P is five steps horizontally and six steps vertically. Now this, this should look very familiar to you. That should look like coordinates on the Cartesian plane. Um, and this is the, the weird part um, because of the order in which you learn things. V vectors are not coordinates on the Cartesian plane the coordinates on a Cartesian plane are vectors, right? Like that's, that's uh, the way that goes. Uh, the Cartesian plane, x and the x and y axis, gives you a place to start from, and then every dot in that grid is the end of a vector from the origin. So these things are in travel instructions. Go five to the right and six up. So how would I write one that heads to the right and down? Uh, so let's make up a new vector then. Let's go with Q is. Okay, so I want it to do four steps horizontally and let's say seven steps vertically. Now I want to make this thing go left and up. So left is, is a horizontal, Thing. So that's the first coordinate. A positive 5 made me go 5 steps to the right. So if I want to go left, I just need to make that negative. So if I were to try and draw this, right, I pick a place to start. And then from that place, I have to go 4 steps to the left. And then I have to go seven steps up. So obviously I've drawn this in the wrong place. Let me try again. Pick a place to start. Take four steps to the left. And then seven steps up. Like so. And I end up with vector Q looking like this. So it's clearly going up and to the left, or to the left and up, whichever order you want to read that. All right, good. So now that you've got the uh, ability to write a vector as an ordered pair, that's what this, how you describe this, um, we need to start looking at this thing, right? The magnitude of that vector. So since I'm using P with an arrow on top of it to mean the whole thing, right? This whole thing, the length, the magnitude, the unit, and the direction, I need to change my notation a little bit if I want to ask you about just the size of the thing. So I'm going to add in the idea of magnitude. which can be interpreted as the length of the vector. That's not, um, it's not 100% correct, but it'll do. Uh, as long as we're dealing with things that are only spatial vectors, then that's fine. So, magnitude is is how how big is this arrow um, and I don't know if you can see that there's a triangle happening here so uh, if I have a triangle 
and I can convince myself that this is a right angle, then all I need is Pythag Pythagorean theorem in order to work that out. So I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem to find the length of this. Uh, Pythagorean theorem says that the length of the hypotenuse is squared is the length of this squared plus the length of this squared. And I'm going to need a symbol to say that I'm looking at just the length of P, not the direction of P. So I'm going to take my vector named P, and I need some sort of symbol that says, give me the size of this. And you've been using it already um, in advanced functions. Uh, you may have seen the absolute value. Absolute value uh, in advanced functions anyway, stripped plus or minus. And in a vector sense, plus, like we showed here, plus meant to the right, negative went to the left. So if you discard that information, you have ignored the direction that that number was pointing and just taken the size. So that's nice and consistent with what we're doing here. So if I have this vector here, the length of it squared should equal the length of this side squared plus the length of this side squared. So the magnitude of P would be 25 plus 36. The magnitude of P would be 61. And so the magnitude of P would be square root 61. Okay. Now, you may be tempted to put that in a calculator and work it out. Uh, and so since square root of 64 would be 8, uh, this is not quite there. I would guess this is around 7.7-ish. Uh, don't do that. This is exact. You're welcome to just leave this as square root of 61. Um, and part of the, the goal here in this course, or in this vector section anyway, is to get comfortable with the idea that this is a perfectly fine answer, uh, that you don't need to evaluate that, and that actually eventually um, having the number in this form is, makes it easier to work with uh, as the problems get more complicated. Uh, because you don't have decimals, you don't have these unending strings. Um, is this like a square root of 61 is an irrational number. It's a, a decimal set that doesn't repeat. Uh, there's no pattern to it. Uh, so the more comfortable you can get with this and the more comfortable you can get with fractions, um, the easier it is to do the calculations and, and grunt work of, of what we're about to do. Uh, so when you get an answer like this, please leave it as root 61. Okay, so uh, if we were to try the magnitude on this one, just really quick, uh, so the magnitude of Q squared should be 7 squared plus negative 4 squared. Magnitude of Q squared is 49 plus 16. Magnitude of Q squared is uh, 55, 65. And so the magnitude of Q, or the, the length of Q, or uh, the size of Q once you strip away the direction, ends up being the square root of 65. And again, I'm going to leave that. Uh, in my head, if I want to know how big that is, um, that's a little more than 64. The square root of 64 is 8. So this is about 8, 8.05 or something like that. Do you notice that the fact that this thing went left didn't matter? And it didn't matter because when you put this negative number into Pythagorean theorem, a negative squared comes out as a positive value. So that's, that's very handy, uh, that this notation of using negatives for up, down, or left, right uh, doesn't affect your calculation of the length. Okay, good. So I'm going to erase this, um, and then we're going to try these same things in three dimensions. And we're going to see how that um, works out.
Okay, so the advantage to this notation uh, is that when whatever works in two dimensions must also work in three dimensions. And um, while we're okay with doing uh, like the length of a hypotenuse in a two-dimensional problem, um, the world isn't two-dimensional. So you need to be able to describe distances and vectors from one place to another in three spatial dimensions, um, left and right, in and out, and up and down. So we've got our three ordered pairs here, um, and we're just going to keep them in alphabetical order. We've got x, we've got y, and now we've introduced a z coordinate. So the tricky part here is trying to visualize what that looks like. Uh, so I'm going to make a poor attempt at rendering this in three dimensions so you can sort of see what's happening there. Um, so I'm going to draw an x-axis, like so. And I'm going to draw a y-axis, like so. So I want you to try and see, actually I'll yeah, that'll be okay. Yeah. I want you to try and see the, uh, the normal x, y axis that you would normally have on a piece of paper from sort of a, a above and to the left kind of perspective. So it's, it's like you're looking at it from above and to the side. And through that, I'm going to draw the z axis. Like so. I think I need to X, Y, Z. Yeah, I'm going to make positive Y up here. Uh, a thing, the thing I'm trying to do right now is called the right-hand rule. The X axis cross the Y axis has to equal the Z axis. You have no idea what that means, but you're going to uh, by the time you get to the vector product section of this independent study. So here we go. I have this location. Uh, that's at 2 on the x, so 1, 2, 6 on the y, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 9 on the z, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. So I'm going to follow my x-coordinate along the y-axis until I get to here. And I'm going to follow my x-axis until I get to my coordinate. So my dot at right, the end of this vector is hovering over this particular spot in the x-y plane. In order to get my z-axis in there, I have to go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there's my spot. And so I'm, I'm traveling up on these uh, these funny angles so that you can sort of see the perspective and the vector I have at the end then starts at the origin and ends at that point 2 comma 6 comma 9 all right so this thing is is two steps to the left six steps forwards and nine steps up So you can write them that way, no problem, x, y, z coordinates. Uh, now we need to think about the magnitude. So the way you do magnitude in two dimensions is you said that the, the magnitude of m would have been the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared if it were in two dimensions. Well now I have to throw in a z coordinate and just, just looking at the pattern. Um, it's really tempting to just 
do that. Now, so I'm going to do it, and it turns out this is true. Uh, we're going to get a number, and then we're going to have to show that that actually works. Um, so here we go. Uh, magnitude of m then would be the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared plus the z coordinate squared. 2 squared is 4, 6 squared is 36, 9 squared is 81. 4 and 36 is 40. 40 plus 81 is 121. So the magnitude of m would be the square root of 121, which is 11. So I've just <laughs> made up an equation that I claim works and I calculated that the length of this line is 11. So I'm going to have to go and I'm going to have to try and use Pythagorean theorem to justify that. Um, so I'm going to record this up here so that we remember what our answer was. I'm going to erase this and then we're going to try and build it by using smaller triangles. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to break this triangle into some sub-triangles. You notice that this dot is hovering over 2 comma 6 in the xy plane. So I'm just going to draw um, sort of a construction line here. Now what, what I have there drawn in perspective is a triangle that is too long because the, the uh, x coordinate is 2 and 6 wide because the y coordinate is 6 and then I've got this line that happens to lay directly under this pink vector so I'm gonna get the length of this and that will give me this number I know that's 9 and I know that this is a 90 degree triangle. So I, if I knew this, I could calculate the length of that using Pythagorean theorem again, um, but I have to get this line first. So this here, um, let's call it, uh, well, let's just call it question mark. This is right angle because X and Y meet at 90 degree angles. So question mark squared should be two squared plus six squared. Question mark squared should be four plus 36, question mark squared should be 40, so question mark should be the square root of 40. And this is one of those examples where I'm just going to leave that. Doesn't have a clean answer if you square root it. Uh, it's somewhere between six and seven, and maybe 6.4-ish, 6.3-ish. I'm just gonna leave it as root 40. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to look at this new triangle I've got. This one here that has a base lying along this line. This as its hypotenuse and this as its back edge. So that triangle, the base here is the same length as this. So it's square root 40. The height of it is 9 and this edge here that I just dashed in is where my vector m lies. So the magnitude of m then squared would be this side squared plus this side squared and maybe you can see now why this this notation just leaving it as the radical is really convenient because the square root of 40 squared these two things undo each other so this term is really just 40 9 squared is 81 and you notice I didn't get any rounding errors if I'd clip this off as as whatever it is, 6.3 something, 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 something. And then I did 6.3 something, something, something squared. What I would have spat out here was 39.999, nine, 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 
whatever. You're not quite right. Um, because the answer is 40, right? Square root of 40 squared is 40. So if you leave it in the radical notation, uh, you end up with nice clean answers. Still got my magnitude of m squared here. 81 and 40 is 121. So magnitude of m would be square root 121, which we already had as being 11. So hooray, it worked. And I can, I can get rid of this allegedly here and just put the smiley face at the end because it worked. So I know this is just one example and it's not a rigorous mathematical proof, but it does demonstrate that adding that z coordinate squared at the end generated the magnitude of that line and we didn't have to do anything terribly complicated. So I'm going to erase this then and we're going to uh, uh, try some operations. So addition and scalar multiplication. So the idea of scalar multiplication is that you take a vector, right, something that has a size and a unit and a direction, and you multiply it by a scalar, which is a number that has a magnitude and a um, unit but no direction. So I've taken this harmless vector here, q, which says go three steps in the x, so, so three to the right, five in the positive y direction, and then down four in z. And I'm gonna ask you to make it three times bigger. So you just write that as three times q, right, like as normal. And because it's a scalar, it's not going to futz with any of the directions. The, the direction of this thing is unmodified by this number because this number doesn't have a direction to muck up the works. Uh, in later units, we're going to figure out how to multiply two things that have directions and see the net direction that comes out. Um, but for now, we're just multiplying by numbers. So don't think too hard about this. I have something that goes three steps in X, forward five steps in Y, and backwards four steps in Z. And I want you to make that three times bigger. Well, I mean, sort of intuitively, if you went three steps in X before and you're going three times that, well, three times three is nine. You should be going nine steps in X. If you went five steps in Y under this vector and you're su supposed to go three times that, then three times five would be 15. And then finally, three times negative four would be negative 12. So if it's a scalar multiplication, all you're doing is taking the coordinates of your vector and multiplying them each individually by that scalar in front. So if Q is 3, 5, negative 4, then 3Q would be 9, 15, negative 12. Similarly, if I had vector P, which was uh, negative 6, negative 3, and 4, and I wanted to find out what negative 2p was. All I'm doing there, right, I look at the front, I see that it's a scalar, right, a number with no direction, and I'm just going to take each of the coordinates in p, double them, and multiply by the, the negative. So negative times negative is positive, negative times positive is negative, just the normal rules you've been doing for integers all along. So minus 2 times minus 6 would be positive 12. Minus 2 times minus 3 would be positive 6. And minus 2 times 4 would be minus 8. All right. Now, I'd like you to, to take a minute to think about what that negative in front did to these vectors. This one was going negative in x. So it was going left. After this multiplication by a negative scalar, now it's positive. It's going right. This was going down, now it's going up. 
this was going positive in Z, now it's going negative in Z. You see that it has switched directions. So a number that's positive makes the vector longer in the same direction. A number that is negative makes the vector longer but goes in the opposite way. So if I were to try and draw these, um, if Q looked like, like this before, then 3Q goes in the same direction, but 1, 2, 3 times as far. P, if P happened to go like this, then negative 2P would be in the exact opposite direction, but twice as far. So hopefully you can start to develop a little bit of spatial sense to see that happening, that this negative made the thing go the other way and twice as far. Uh, last example we're going to do is one where the scalar happens to be between negative 1 and 1 so that it, uh, it looks like a fraction. So if we had, uh, let's go with r is 3, 7, 8. And I want to know what negative one quarter of R is. Well, I mean, the rules aren't different. You're just multiplying each of these coordinates by a quarter. So 3 times a negative quarter would be negative 3 quarters. 7 times negative a quarter would be negative 7 quarters. And 8 times negative quarter would be negative 8 over a quarter. And some of these things reduce, some of them don't. So negative 3 quarters, that doesn't reduce. Negative 7 quarters, that doesn't reduce. Negative 8 divided by 4, well that's just, ne that's just negative 2. So I'd like you to look at uh, this particular value here, the 8 to the negative 2. Because this is negative, it has flipped directions. And you notice that's happened with all three of them. This used to go right, now it goes left. This used to go up, now it goes down. This used to go positive in the z direction, now it goes negative. So the negative here in my scalar has switched directions. The quarter has made it go less far. So it used to go 8 units, now it only goes 2. It, it's a quarter of the length it used to be. So if r used to be like this, then negative 1 quarter r goes in the opposite direction. And if I just cut that in half and then cut it in 4 to get a sense of the size, it's about that long. That's negative one quarter r. All right, good. So this leads to an interesting point, this last one down here. Uh, there is no such thing as scalar division. I'll let you think about that for a minute. Because all division does is take a vector and chop it up into bits, right? Like it would take, it takes large quantities and divides them into smaller piles. Uh, well, I pulled that off by multiplying by a fraction. So we don't need rules for scalar multiplication. If you want to shrink a vector, you just multiply it by a number less than one. So if you want to divide a vector into eight pieces, you multiply by one eighth. If you only wanted uh, to, to, if you wanted to cut it in two, you'd multiply by a half. 
etc. We're going to find out later that subtraction is also not a thing. Uh, and, and then you just have to wrap your brain around the idea that division and subtraction actually never were things. Um, they're just sort of illusions uh, where you're doing addition and multiplication backwards. Um, and that's, that's not a different operator, that's just, uh, um, you know, <laughs> walking from your house to school and walking from your, the school to your house isn't a different path. Right? It's not a different trip. It's just the same trip in a different direction. So if you can start thinking about multiplication and addition as the only operators that you can do with things in general, um, it's going to make this a little bit easier to wrap your head around. So now that we've done the multiplication, we need to do the addition, um, and then I think we're good to try some practice problems. Okay, so to justify um, the addition of two vectors, I'm going to use a grid um, and I'm going to do a two-dimensional example first to try and, and help you see uh, what's, what's happening here. So I'm just going to draw a little, a little origin on my grid here. It's a place where I'm going to start. So I want to figure out what P plus Q would be. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a vector p and I'm going to see that that's three steps to the right and eight steps down. So I'm going to do that from my origin, one, two, three steps to the right and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps down. So that's p. Next thing I'm going to do is from the end of vector p, I'm going to go in the directions that vector q has said. So vector q says take four steps to the right and six steps up. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like that. That's vector q. So this statement here, what is p plus q, in English is saying if you traveled along vector p and then you traveled along vector q, where would you end up? So if I look at this diagram from my origin, this is where I started, this is where I stopped, and I need, just need to figure out where that is. So to get to this point, I'm going to have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 to the right, and 1, 2, down. So that vector, p plus q, starts at the origin and ends here. So to get from here to here, all you need to do is take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps to the right, and one, two steps down. So do you notice that taking a vector and adding a vector makes a vector as an answer, something that has a size and something that has a direction? Do you notice also that um, <laughs> the way to interpret this is that you could either go from here to here, then here to here, or you could travel along this path and you would end up at the same location. So that's what this is trying to ask you. Like, what is the shortest path that would allow you to end up at the same spot as if you followed this, then that? Do you notice also that 3 plus 4 is 7 and that minus 8 plus 6 is minus 2? That's not an accident. And if you think about that, right, this vector said take three steps to the right. This vector said take four steps to the right. If you did both of those things, you'd be seven steps to the right. If this one says go down eight, and this one says go up six, if you did both of those things, down eight, then up six, you end up two lower than you started. So that should make some intuitive sense to you. 
We're going to erase these, and we're going to try and figure out what p minus q would be. I'm sure you already have an answer, uh, but I'm going to draw it so you can see what's happening. So get rid of p and q. I guess I need to get rid of p. So how do I interpret this negative q? Well, I said in the last uh, last section there that there was no such thing as vector subtraction, and that that is true. What I have here is actually p plus negative q. Now that's uh, that <laughs> that's trickery, right? What's the difference? Uh, in the last section, we did multiply by negatives. So negative q is the same as negative 1q. Multiplying by a scalar negative 1. Uh, 1 doesn't change the size of that thing. right? 1 times 4 uh, is 4. 1 times 6 is 6. But the negative switches its direction. So in this particular example, I have to take my vector p, and then I have to travel backwards along Q, which I'm just noticing isn't going to fit on my grid, so I'm going to move it. So let's try drawing that. Pick an origin somewhere. Draw my vector P, which is 3 to the right, 1, 2, 3, and down 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There we go. Now Q, Q used to go 4 to the right and 6 up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's it used to be there, but I've been asked to go backwards on Q. That's what a subtraction means in vectors, is you're not taking anything away, you're traveling the opposite direction. So instead of 4 to the right and 6 up, I'm going four to the left, one, two, three, four, and six down, one, two, three, four, five, six. Because that is negative Q. So my answer to this particular um, addition of a negative vector is that to get to this point from the origin, I have to go uh, one step to the left, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen down. So that's one step to the left, and fourteen steps down. So I end up with this vector like so. That's P minus Q. So if I were to travel forwards on P and backwards on Q, I would end up at this location. We just call it P minus Q. And the net instructions for that is to go backwards 1 and 14 down. Now I'd like you to notice again that we did P minus Q. So 3 minus 4 is negative 1. And negative 8 minus 6 is negative 14. So net, all you're doing is taking the coordinates of each vector and then executing this particular operator. So if I had something like z is 3, 5, 9, and w is 4, 2, 8, and I wanted to know what z plus w was, well, all I have to do is take the individual coordinates of z and w and add them together. So if I go 3 in x for z and 4 in x for w, then I must have gone 7 in total. 5 in y, 2 in y is 7 in total. 9 in Z and 8 in Z is 17 in total. So if I traveled on this vector first, then this vector, I would end up this far from the origin.
Similarly, if I wanted to find out what z subtract w is, or rather go forwards on z and backwards on w, I end up just having to subtract these coordinates. So 3 minus 4, so forwards 3, backwards 4, leaves me 1 behind. Forwards 5, backwards 2, leaves me 3 ahead. Forwards 9, backwards 8, leaves me 1 behind. So that's where I would end up if I went forwards on Z and then backed up on W. So the, the actual operation isn't terribly complicated. What is a little tricky is trying to see this in your head. And in order to, um, to get good at this, especially when we get into the next chunk where we're trying to write the equations of lines in three dimensions, or the chunk after that where you're trying to define the equations of surfaces in three dimensions, you need to start developing a bit of spatial sense. So you need to take a minute to think about what this looks like in a three-dimensional space and where this dot is in three-dimensional space and then try connecting the two and see if you get that as your answer. Well, that's, that's hard, uh, and this is abstract. Um, trust me, it will come to you. <laughs> after, the t after we're done this course, you're going to have a good sense of that. So just try and keep that in your mind. Don't just follow algorithms. Try and see what you're doing. So the last thing we've got to do then is a little bit of order of operations, uh, and then we're good for the practice problems. All right, so given vector k is 8 in x, negative 3 in y, 2 in z, vector f is negative 2 in x, negative 1 in y, and 6 in z, what would 3 f's, uh, forward 3, uh, forward on f three times, and backwards on k four times, where would that end up? So I'm just going to take my scalars, and I'm going to drop my vectors in. So 3, f would be negative 2, negative 1, 6, negative 4, 8, negative 3, 2. So now that they're in there, um, order of operations still applies to vectors, which means you have to do your multiplications first and then your additions. So I have a scalar multiplication here, so I'm going to have to put that into this ordered triplet. And I have a scalar here to put into this ordered triplet, so I'm going to do that. Three of these would be negative 6, negative 3, 18. Negative 4 of these would be negative 32. 12, negative 8. Now this I've chosen to take the negative scalar with me so that this is now just an addition of two vectors. Minus 6 and minus 32 would be negative 38. Negative 3 and 12 would be 9. 18 and negative 8 would be 10. So if you were to travel along F three times and then travel along K four times in the wrong direction, you would end up at negative 38 on the X, 9 on the Y, 10 on the Z.